All right. Um, it's really lovely to see you all here. So many familiar faces and some new faces as well. My name is Mary Claire Whalen, um, or you can call me MC. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the coordinator of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance. I'm also a farm worker at Masaro Community Farm in Woodbridge, Connecticut. If you all want to start by also introducing yourselves in the chat, I would love to get a sense of who's in the room, where you're from, what farm you work at, or what farm you manage. Um, I would also love to see you all on video, at least for a few moments, just so I don't feel like I'm giving my intro to an empty room, but I also totally understand the need to go on and off video throughout the event. Um, in just a second, uh, the president of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance, Will Amira, is going to introduce our organization and our speakers. We're lucky enough to be joined tonight by Commissioner Brian Hurlbert, Hurlbert the Commissioner of Agriculture in Connecticut, and Jamie Smith, the Director of Agricultural Development and Research, Resource Conservation at the department. Commissioner Hurlbert and um, Director Smith will be giving about a 20 to 30 minute presentation, um, and then we are going to be opening it up to questions. Sorry, people are coming into the waiting room and I'm just letting them in. Um, the way that the Q&A a little bit later on is going to work is that you all can type your questions into the chat. Will and I will be sorting through that um, and picking out questions that we think there's a lot of interest in. Um, and then we'll call on you to speak your question aloud and our speakers will try to respond within three to five minutes. Um, like at all New Connecticut Farmer Alliance events, we want there to be room for dis constructive disagreement in this space. But I would also ask that we all remember that um, we're all farmers and we can all be respectful to each other and kind um, as we discuss these important issues. Uh, I would also ask question askers to keep their questions to just one minute so that we can um, make sure we address as many topics as possible in our limited time. Um, all right, without further ado, I think I'll hand it over to Will Omira. Hi folks, uh, my name is Will Omira. I am the uh, lone co-president of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance right now. We need to have an election to fill that other seat. Um, and I am the co-owner and operator of Hungry Reaper Farm in Morris, Connecticut, where my fiance and I grow a couple of acres of organic vegetables. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out of the busy spring season to uh, come together for this town hall tonight. Uh, many of you are likely already members of the New Connecticut Farmer Alliance, but for those of you who are not, welcome. Uh, we're so glad to have you. We were founded in 2010 by a group of young farmers who were determined to create an environment in Connecticut that was uh, responsive and uplifting for both new and beginning farmers. The New Connecticut Farmer Alliance is a chapter of the National Young Farmer Coalition, uh, and we are a statewide network of farmers and growers. Uh, by bringing together new, young, and beginning farmers, uh, it is our intent to identify and help support, uh, develop support systems to nurture a successful and diverse agricultural landscape for our state. Our mission is to bring together emerging farmers from across Connecticut to network share resources and identify common challenges and opportunities for a more accessible, successful and diverse agricultural community. Um, what that looks like on the ground is that we run a 400 plus member listserv where our members uh, you know, ask each other questions, uh, you know, share resources, borrow equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, we help to coordinate a peer-to-peer -peer learning network with Connecticut NOFA, which just launched earlier this year. Uh, we engage in policy advocacy at both the state and federal level, and we host several educational and social events throughout the year, uh, like this town hall. We encourage you all to join. Uh, if you follow the link in the chat from MC, you can do that uh, very easily and engage in our work. Uh, we are free to join, uh, and you know all farmers are welcome, regardless of age, experience, uh, you know types of crops grown, etc. Uh, we are so pleased to have two guests with us this evening from the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. Hopefully many of you know these folks already, and I would ask you to please give them a very warm welcome. And they are Jamie Smith, the Director of the Bureau of Agricultural Development and Resource Conservation, and Commissioner Brian Hurlbert, 
Uh, Commissioner Herbert and Director Smith, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you, MC. Thank you to all the members and attendees um, for taking time out of a, a relatively busy season and finding some of your precious evening hours um, to join us tonight and hear what's going on in the department and share your thoughts with us. I uh, just want to point out, um, we also have Serena Thibodeau uh, here from the department. Um, she's flying under the radar without her, her Zoom background, but she's um, going to be a really important person in all of your world. Um, and you'll hear about that in just a moment. Um, but it's, it's great to be here. And uh, I do look forward to when we can do these in person. Um, but uh, as we all know, COVID is still out there. Uh, Connecticut has been spiking. It's really important that we maintain our social distancing, wear our masks, wash our hands as frequently as we need to, um, get vaccinated. Um, I feel uh, uh, lucky that um, today was the first day that I could schedule my vaccination too. Everybody around me has been talking about getting their vaccine. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to schedule mine. Um, but uh, I strongly encourage everybody um, to get on through VAMS or one of the other systems to get your vaccine. Um, that's going to be one of the most important things um, that we can do um, to combat COVID and get life back to some semblance of normalcy here. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, we've got a, a, a 9,000 page PowerPoint that I'm going to walk you through a couple minutes at a time. Uh, Will, can you see that? Great. Great. Um, just kidding. We, we, we do have a bunch of stuff that we want to share with you, um, but the goal is to, uh, to get through it in about 20, 25 minutes um, because we don't get a chance to talk to all of you uh, nearly enough um, and want to make sure that we have the opportunity for dialogue um, uh, back and forth with, uh, and, and hit some of your questions. Um, so we're going to run through, you know, what's been going on in the agency, um, what, we, what we've done so far in the past year in response to COVID, um, I'm going to turn over to Jamie for a very important topic for this group, the Farm Transition Grant updates and, and general information. Um, I'm going to walk through our recently announced DEI working group, um, then back over to Jamie for our Connecticut Growing Campaign, and we'll hit the open forum. Um, so if, if people could, you know, put your questions in chat as we go through these, I think that'll make it easier for us and a little bit quicker for us to get through um, the PowerPoint and uh, hit all the questions on the end. Um, just a, a couple of, of um, updates um, from the agency perspective. Um, this year, in the, in the midst of um, the COVID pandemic, we've hired five new people in agriculture development and resource conservation. That's really the, the bureau of the agency that is most engaged with, uh, with our farmers, with our grant opportunities, with our promotion efforts, um, and with our, with our farmland preservation efforts. So having five new people um, all come on board after we started working remotely is pretty tremendous. It's one of the biggest investments in a year in that bureau in a very, very long time, if forever. Um, and one of the, the folks that we, we um, brought on, um, who I just introduced, Serena, um, we've asked her to be our new and beginning in urban uh, agriculture point of contact. Um, the agency's never had somebody designated to be um, the individual where people, new and beginning farmers or people interested in urban agriculture um, can specifically call as opposed to just kind of the, the general number. Uh, and Serena um, is taking on that responsibility. And, and to me, that's really important that we as a department recognize um, that this is a, is a growing um, community and that we better understand it. So it's important for um, for us to have Serena as a point of contact, but it's also important for you all to contact her with your questions, with your suggestions, with your comments, to make sure that we're hitting the information and getting the communication um, flowing appropriately. So um, she's she should not be a stranger to you. Um, I will admit I've only met her once in person, and, and it was last Monday. So, um, but I've I've been on Zoom with her. Um, many hours every single week. Um, so I can attest that she's, um, she's a great person and doing a great job for the agency. A couple of grant updates. Um, we recently closed our farmland restoration program uh, grant application period. We had over 60 applications come in. Um, we're looking uh, between 20 and 30 grants going out. Um, this was a rolling uh, application period before we, we changed it to a, a deadline. Um, but if you're looking to do work on your farm, 
um, and, and bring land back into production, check out that farmland restoration grant. It's a matching grant um, that you can use your time and equipment as a match uh, for up to $25,000 of, of uh, a direct payment from the agency. Um, it's, it's a really great tool that we have to help people put land back into production. Um, our farm transition grant program, Jamie's gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, we did also just close our USDA specialty crop block grant. And the reason why I put this one up here um, is just to demonstrate we've shifted the funding priority areas, um, recognizing that uh, agriculture looks a little bit different in Connecticut than it has um, over the previous um, years. And we wanted to make sure that our, our, all of our grant programs are better aligned with the needs. Um, so food systems um, is, is one of the priority areas. Connecticut grown value added processing um, to make sure that people have the ability to um, uh, get, a, get an investment um, in doing some value add. Um, food security items, um, food safety, uh, climate change, um, and then also controlled environment ag, uh, making sure that um, as, as tandem with our climate change initiatives and goals, um, that we're helping people get through that learning curve and understand how um, they can um, grow in a controlled environment. Um, and then we'll be releasing our agriculture viability um, grant program uh, application period um, in the next couple months. Um, that's the program that nonprofits, trade organizations, municipalities um, can apply for. So be thinking about ways that the new Connecticut Farmer Alliance um, could apply for a project that would benefit um, the organization. And, and, and we wanna make sure that you know about that program. Um, Jamie can answer questions um, on it. You know, if you have specifics, um, she does, or not, Jamie doesn't do them anymore, um, but we do um, outreach and forums um, and we'll make sure that you all have information about where and when those are happening um, to attend. On our farmland preservation unit, uh, two of those five new hires um, were in farmland preservation. Um, we just closed, uh, actually yesterday, the, the Ale Farmland uh, Preservation Grants. Those are the applications that we put into the Natural Resource Conservation Service to receive the federal match. Um, and so we're reviewing those 15 applications with NRCS, um, getting that information in there. I also want to point out on this one that um, these, this grant period was, or the application period was supposed to close a month ago. Um, and we realized that there were some IT issues, there were some problems getting information from FSA to NRCS, um, and we stepped in and, and uh, we intervened and requested that we extend the application period to make sure that everybody who um, was interested had the opportunity to get their paperwork in, to get to FSA um, and, and get their application done. Um, thankfully, we have a great relationship with Tom Morgard over at um, NRCS and uh, Nate Wilson, the interim uh, state executive director at FSA. Um, and we, we all agreed that this was in the best interest of, um, of the community to extend this application period. It's just a great example of how we are, as all service providers, trying to work together um, to meet the needs of the industry. Um, in 2020, amidst COVID with, um, with somebody um, who left us and then bringing on two new people, we were still able to preserve over a thousand acres on 13 farms. Also importantly, um, in the precious few dollars that we have for farmland preservation, 47% of the dollars that were spent on, on farmland preservation um, came from either the federal government or a local uh, municipal match. Um, so we are extending those dollars greatly. Um, and for the first time, I think and that ever happened, a, a, a number of those farms were community farm program uh, PDRs. Most of uh, our, our farmland preservation program um, have gone through the traditional PDR. Um, we had to flip um, in order to work through some administrative um, challenges that we have with a, with a sister organization. Um, we also have announced and seated our Farmland Preservation Advisory Board. Um, this was something that I've been talking about getting up and running. Um, none of the appointments are uh, DOAG appointments. Um, so we had to work with the legislature, with the governor's office. Um, and for those who don't know, Will is, has, is, an, is a member of the Farmland Preservation Advisory Board, an appointed member. Um, and so we, uh, we have a number of things that we've tasked the Farmland Preservation Advisory Board with um, as, as a 
way to jumpstart um, the, the, um, the, the membership and give them something to focus on. So we have both PDR and community farm regulations um, updates. They haven't been updated um, in I think 34, 35 years, I'm not joking on that. Um, and so it's time to update our farmland preservation regs. The community farm regs were adopted right after the um, program was um, passed by the legislature. They needed some modifications as well. One of the other things that we have the Farmland Preservation Advisory Board working on that came to us from our Farmland Access uh, Working Group is to study the option to purchase at ag value and come up with recommendations as to um, what and how we could um, put something like that in place in Connecticut. Uh, for um, and again, I apologize that I'm going quickly, but I want to make sure that we 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 get we get as much information out there, and we will be sending this PowerPoint out to everybody. So. If anybody's out there scribbling notes, um, you can put your pen down and focus and, and you'll get this uh, uh, after the, we're done tonight. Um, the legislature is in full swing um, for in a full swing as COVID goes, I should say. Um, one of the bills that the, the department submitted is an act concerning agricultural enhancements. Um, that one, I think it would be of particular interest um, to this group. It adds eggs to our farmer's market nutrition programs. Um, it, it does a number of other um, items to clean up some of our, um, some of our uh, farm, uh, farmer's market programs. Um, we can get you the bill number and the information. We also submitted testimony in support of the Governor's Council on Climate Change. Uh, I chaired the Ag and Soils Working Group um, uh, for, uh, over the course of the past year and a half. Thank you to those folks who attended, who participated, who submitted um, their um, uh, uh, considerations for that. Um, we have a number of items in the GC3 recommendation that Commissioner Dykes put forward that would benefit agriculture. Um, and we also submitted testimony in support of the Healthy Soils Bill um, in, in conjunction with um, the GC3 proposal. I, I put on here the Food Policy Council just to let people know that we are, uh, again, we have seated our members, we are working on it, we have a budget, we are putting together um, an RFP um, for, uh, for the ability to actually spend down those dollars that have been uh, committed to us through the Community Investment Act. Um, to make sure that our Food Policy Council is active and engaged in putting forward good recommendations and doing some of the work um, that we as a department don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, but we have these tools like the Food Policy Council to deploy against um, the need. Some of you on this call um, know that we've been integrally involved with the food distribution coordination with the Farmer to Family Food Box Program, the distribution of shelf-stable food boxes at um, testing sites for people who are food is the cure, uh, the um, uh, distribution of uh, boxes to seniors and others in congregate housing who are at risk um, for COVID, um, and also for those who during the contact tracing period have an immediate food insecurity need. Um, through the Farmer to Family Food Box program alone, we have distributed um, or coordinated the distribution of over 600,000 boxes of food over the past about seven months now. Um, I, I put on here that uh, we participate in the USDA a listening session um, last week, the, we worked with the Connecticut congressional delegation um, to draft a letter to USDA. Um, while we understand that the Farm to Family Food Box program did a great job of feeding families in need, it could have done a much better job of providing resources to the agricultural community in the different states. Um, and so um, our comments um, and the delegation's comments go to that, that, that uh, um, you know, the first couple periods, Connecticut had two contractors that it were awarded um, by developing a much stronger program. It could have been a lot better for the local communities that we're trying to serve. Um, and so hopefully um, USDA um, used that listening session. It was over 12 hours long um, to, um, to revise uh, their proposal. This program continues through the end of April. Um, I'm expecting that um, for the May um, announcement that there will be some, um, some new information and some program revisions. One of the other things we've heard, um, not only during COVID, but um, preceding COVID, is the need for additional capacity in meat processing. Um, and so um, we are um, hosting with uh, UConn and Extension and USDA um, next Thursday evening. If you want to continue to spend your Thursday evenings with the Department of Agriculture, we're happy to spend the time with you. Um, a, uh, a webinar um, with USDA as to the different programs that USDA offers to 
support um, processing infrastructure. Um, I, I just want to be clear, and this question has come to me from a number of different sources, um, from a number of different people over, over the past couple months. The department does not have the capacity or the ability, um, it is not intended to set up a processing facility. Um, our goal is to support um, individuals or organizations that want to do it on their own and make sure they have the resources to be successful. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we're doing that by sharing um, uh, the three different USDA agencies um, programs um, that we think could help um, put that together. Um, during COVID, we've done a boatload of activities, including uh, town halls like this, for folks who aren't on our ag report, I strongly suggest that you sign up. Um, it's a weekly uh, notification about what's going on. Um, it's an easy read, but we put in a lot of great information about other events um, that are happening. Um, not just watch, uh, we, we try not to flood your box, but it's a great way to get a bunch of information that you may not otherwise have access to. Um, we've done a bunch of media. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to our COVID site, um, we've got a number of guidance documents up there that um, I think you should take a look at as we head into another season under um, the COVID protocol. Um, we've made a whole bunch of things available, whether it be PPE, hand sanitizer, or um, different signage um, for folks to use on their farm. The goal is that um, we intervene between you and your customers so that your customers aren't upset that you are requiring six feet of social distancing or wearing a mask or any of those other protocols. We don't want to ne do anything that would neg negatively impact your relationship um, with your customers. And so by Asserting ourselves and putting the Department of Agriculture logo on there, um, we're hoping that it deflects any anger or or, uh, or or disagreement, and you can just say, "I'm sorry, this is the department." Um, for 2021, we've had a, a number of questions on this already. You know, what are what are we going to require? We're going to follow the CDC recommendations, the Department of Public Health recommendations, and work with the Department of Economic and Community Development on any guidance that needs to be revised. As of right now, and again, this could change. Um, as of right now, the CDC guidance is vaccinated or not, six feet apart, wear a mask, wash your hands regularly. Um, and so we will be rolling that out and continuing that um, out there. So um, I know a lot of folks are, are, are wondering, you know, what, what will it be? As of right now, we're going to hold the same guidance that we've held for the previous year. And that is also to make sure that you as farmers stay healthy and can continue to farm and attend markets. And I'm going to give it over to Jamie now. And Jamie, just you know, ding or tell me to flip whenever you're ready with a page um, to move the uh, the presentation along here. Right. Thanks, Mish. Hi, everyone. Um, so I know many are familiar with our farm transition grant, but this year our program um, was given a lot of consideration as to how it could be uh, structured a little bit differently in hopes of filling. And responding to some of the needs that are in small focus groups to get some feedback on the approach that we were taking uh, to make sure that the industry would be receptive to the areas that we were targeting and um, also address areas that me, we may have overlooked. And so um, one of the examples that we kind of uh, look back upon, and, and this is just one of many, um, is a small farm called High Ridge Hydro ponics that's partnering with the city of Bridgeport. Um, they approached us uh, a couple years ago to be funded through our farm transition grant, but did not meet the three-year minimum experience requirement. And so um, we connected them with the city and they have um, since moved forward with um, a project in partnership with the city um, to expand production. They're doing um, urban container gardening um, and, and growing and they're working with um, ooh, not GBI. Um, oh gosh, throw me a bone commission. East End NRZ um, market to um, produce fresh produce uh, to be sold at their store. So in an effort to um, not find ourselves in that position with other folks that might come down the pike, um, we created a total of five new categories um, 
to, you know, again, be responsive and, and kind of encourage innovation and get ahead of the curve. And so I think the one of most significance, which I'll go into detail in just a minute about, is the new farmer micro grant. Um, this requires only one year of production history and has a max award of $5,000. There is a modest uh, match requirement, um, and you'll see that through all of our categories. Misha, if you want to go back one, I'll run through the other ones too. Um, the other uh, four categories, so we have the infrastructure investment grant, which is what folks might compare to the traditional farm transition grant. So a max award of 20,000, um, this has a match capacity of 50%. Um, this is going to be funding, you know, the buildings, the um, purchase of equipment, things along those lines. We do still want to see projects expand, diversify. Uh, the farming business. And a new category is the research and development grant. So for farms that are looking to uh, diversify into a new commodity service, uh, value-added product that they're a little on the fence about, that's kind of outside of their norm, this is an opportunity to pursue funding to help you explore whether or not that that's a good investment of funds long-term. This will cover consultants. Um, it has a max award of 25,000 and it has of 25%. Uh, the Innovation and Diversification Grant, this is our largest grant award. Um, we anticipate projects um, that are coming through this grant category to be approximately 100,000 or more. So this is, you've done the R&D component of, in some capacity. You don't necessarily need to have received our grant program, uh, but you've done the research and development. You realize that the new uh, commodity, the new pasta sauce, the new you know, custom harvesting that um, you want to do is going to be a good investment and uh, return on investment. Now you're gonna to come to us to actually purchase the items or the equipment um, to implement that long-term into your business. And so that has a max award of 49,999 and that has a 50% uh, cash match. The last grant um, that's going to sort of be an as needed grant program is the emergency response grant. These are smaller grant awards that are intended to come in and provide support after loans, emergency response funding through the USDA, um, and insurance has been exhausted. So if you want to flip to the next one, Commissioner, we'll talk more on the um, new farmer um, uh, micro grant. So for all of our grant programs, um, we do have eligibility criteria. We do want to see that you're going to have a farmer's tax exemption permit. Um, through the Department of Revenue Services in that application. We want to see that you have at least a two to five year business plan. One of the things that I always tend to say to farmers who apply for any of our grant programs are, why are you applying for this? Do you have a business plan that tells you that this is the next best step for you to make in an, an investment for your business. We want to see that you have a crop plan, that you have a, a plan for production, whether it be livestock or um, produce. You need to be, again, in production for at least a year. And if you are leasing a, a property, which is obviously very common, we want to see a written agreement, right? Um, when we originally released this guidance, we had 10 years in there. And the industry came back and they're like, what, 10 years? I have a 10-year written lease. So we gave that some consideration. And so um, especially when we really take into consideration how 2020 impacted um, agreements and credit and everything along those lines, we said, okay, we just want to see an agreement between you and the property owner, whether it be, you know, you're renting storefront or you're renting acreage, that there is an agreement that um, you're good to do this project. So let me give it a full. Whip. All right, so the new farmer micro grant, which I'm sure most folks are um, interested in. So the new farmer micro grant, again, has a max award of $5,000. It has a 25% project cost match. So when we talk about match, you're, we're going to fund um, 
75% of the total project costs up to $5,000. And that remaining 25% of the project costs you need to cover. Those do need to be cash outlays. Um, what is generally challenging that we hear from folks is this is a reimbursement grant. So you need to um, pay for the project and then we'll reimburse you. One of the things that um, we have written into the guidance is that if you're interested in receiving a 50% cash advance of this award, we are willing to do that, knowing that this is typically cash outlays or a challenge for new and beginning farmers. We are not um, entertaining that or considering that for any of our other grant programs. Um, eligible expenses are expenses that are critical for the business to get up and running that would not be covered by other programs or services. So we have small equipment, buildings, greenhouse, hoop houses, caterpillar tunnels, um, any small equipment purchases that are related to production, we're happy to cover. So um, we do want to see that you have a year of production history and that you have long-term plans um, to make this uh, full-time or part-time venture. So, finish. All right. DEI, that's all you, Commissioner. All right, thank you, Jamie. And as Jamie pointed out, a number of those provisions in the micro grant are designed specifically for new and beginning farmers, recognizing that new and beginning farmers have different challenges and needs and access um, issues. So um, we, we took that into consideration and, and really played with it um, to make sure that we were um, addressing the need. Um, many of you have probably, I hope many of you have heard about our new diversity, equity, and inclusion working group. Um, we kicked this off a couple of weeks ago, and I put Governor uh, Lamont's quote in here because this, uh, this effort is a reflection of his desire to make sure that all of the agencies in the state are working for all of the people in the state. Um, and we are taking that um, to heart with our uh, in the ag community and making sure that we are reducing barriers, that we're improving outreach, that we're, uh, we're educating both sides of the equation, whether it be the service providers or the community members, um, that uh, agriculture is a place, a career, or a future for everyone in the state, regardless of your background, color of your skin, um, or where you live. Um, and so this is a, a, a very exciting initiative that we're launching. Serena is actually going to be staffing this project as well. Um, it fits right in with her new, uh, new and beginning and urban ag focus. Um, and she's done a lot of uh, research uh, on this um, and homework on this. Um, but this working group is designed to recognize the need for institutional support for current and future individuals of color entering professions throughout the sector. Um, we want to improve the agency outreach, but also, as I mentioned earlier, industry-wide, um, not just with um, trade groups, um, but also our support organizations um, for, uh, and, and that goes across state, federal, um, and nonprofit um, uh, silos to make sure that our BIPOC community knows where resources are, how to access them, and, and feels comfortable accessing them. Um, we're going to be, we're taking the pole position as the leaders in the state in terms of our agricultural industry to drive this forward. Um, we're going to use the bully pulpit that we have um, as the Department of Agriculture um, to pull people along and make sure that they all understand how important this is. Um, if you are interested in joining this working group um, or one of the sub working groups, we are closing nominations on Monday, April 12th. So if you're interested in it, if you're interested in presenting, if you're interested in participating or listening, um, please um, apply. The, the goal here is that we have a robust, diverse group of individuals focused on um, a number of different sub working groups, but the, the entire um, outreach in general. So I'm hopeful that um, I will see some of the attendees um, come through um, the working group um, uh, application process. A little bit about the working group. We're going to have 12 appointees um, from across the state. Um, I'm going to chair the, the, app, the effort. Um, the, the large working group, the, the main working group, will be responsible for driving the overall direction and then synthesizing all the recommendations. Um, as a member of the working group, you, you will have a leadership role on one of the sub-working groups. Um, and I put chair, co-chair, vice chair, we'll let you figure out, or the sub-working group, how, figure out how they want to, to structure their leadership. 
Um, but these are the five different subworking groups that we've identified as um, the largest hurdles um, to, to overcome. Access to land, capital and financial planning, education and training, resources, infrastructure, and business planning. is also market access and diversification. How can you get your products um, into a number of different channels? We've seen through um, COVID um, that we can't always count on one channel to be there all the time or regularly um, or at the same level that uh, people have expected it to be. Um, so how can we make sure that Connecticut farmers have access to different channels? And we also recognize um, that different restaurants that uh, do different cultural cooking have different needs and different ingredients and different crops that they want to source. Um, so can we part through our, through our farm to chef network, um, farmers with restaurants to make sure that those restaurants can buy Connecticut grown goods um, to use in their restaurant, regardless of uh, what type of food they're serving. Um, a couple of the ideas that um, we're asking the working group and the sub working groups to focus on. Um, we put in here, and this is really important, the development of workable recommendations. This is not a thought process that we're engaging in. This is a process to drive outcomes and to make sure that we have actionable outcomes that will result in a better um, agricultural community for everybody. And so that's why we included in their workable recommendations. Um, Make sure we identify the challenges and the barriers. I don't know that we have a comprehensive list. Um, we need to sit down and actually do that. What are all the challenges that we need to address and how can we go about addressing them? We also recognize that we need to do a lot of outreach. Um, there's a trust issue here. There's relationships that need to be built. Um, we need to make sure that people um, feel comfortable um, and the information is going both back out into the community and from the community to the working group and to the agency. Um, and that's one of the main roles of these members is to make sure that that information um, does get disseminated. I know how important trust is in the relationships between farmers and their consumers and their contractors. Um, we need to establish that same thing um, between the agency, the trade organizations and the support organizations um, in, in the BIPOC community. That it, it doesn't exist um, or it exists only in pockets. We need to make sure that it is strong and robust as it is across other uh, components of agriculture. We need to acknowledge what exists and identify what doesn't. Um, and then we will, uh, again, using the leadership role that the department has, um, work with our sister agencies, um, organizations to help them work on the recommendations that were identified and the gaps that are in their programmatic areas. Um, and then the, the goal is that we're gonna develop recommendations that will help achieve in a larger um, critical mass of a diverse um, agricultural community that reflects the diversity in the state of Connecticut. Um, Secretary Vilsack has been talking about this at USDA. I was actually a little disappointed. He jumped the gun um, and got in, in place in front of us by, by a week or two um, announcing USDA's efforts. Um, but I think that we can do this in tandem with USDA's efforts and make sure that we are sharing information and inviting our USDA partners to the table. Um, so we're not all trying to do different things. We're all focused on working together to achieve the goal that we're aiming for. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Jamie for the Connecticut Grown Campaign. So uh, last Monday, we launched our new uh, Connecticut Grown Campaign and uh, revealed our revised Connecticut Grown brand. Um, but I, I do want to kind of back up to the beginning uh, for folks to kind of let them know we really started this project um, in late 2019. Um, our original intent was to do something in 2020, and we quickly realized that that was not a good uh, decision, and to hold off was really the best way to go forward. And so in early 2020, um, we put a survey out to the industry to say, what do all of you want to see in a campaign? And the responses to that is what formulated the um, request for proposals that uh, went out to, I don't even know how many um, media marketing firms here in the state. 
Um, we hired Miranda Creative, which is a firm out of uh, Norwich, Connecticut. Um, we selected them because they had previous experience working with a number of other firms in the state. And we found that their perspective and understanding of ag was far above and beyond anybody else's. And that was a really wonderful place to start. Um, in late September, they went out and did three days of photo shoots. Um, I think there are some folks who are on the call who got to participate in those. Um, and they expanded our um, photo assets by over 500 absolutely beautiful photos um, and over 150 hours of video. Um, what I do want to tell everyone is that took place in late September. And so we have another round of photography and video coming our way um, for late spring and early summer crops. Um, we don't have any berries, we don't have greenhouse, we don't have, um, you know, what a, produce in general. So um, know that that is coming down the pipe. So um, while they were taking all these photos and doing all these videos, um, they also, we worked with a research firm to develop surveys that went out to consumers, buyers of Connecticut grown products, so wholesalers, restaurants, grocery stores, um, and a survey for the industry to provide some feedback on their perception of the current Connecticut grown brand that was created back in 1985. Um, from there, they did focus groups for each of those respective uh, segments and put before them uh, test messaging and brand concepts um, so that we had some guidance to know what people were going to be receptive to and what um, consumers wanted to see out of a brand. And that's really what led us to the current brand that you see behind Commissioner and I and um, on our PowerPoint. Well, um, we certainly helped guide them in what we thought um, folks would be receptive to. This isn't um, a concept that folks um, are seeing because we thought it looked nice. It truly was built off of um, data and survey and genuine feedback from folks. Um, so as we launch the brand and as we kick off the campaign, which is going to run now through the end of December, we're um, revealing or releasing some new components that we haven't had before. Of uh, biggest note is ctgrown.org, which is our consumer-facing website. Um, and on that website, through a partnership with CT NOPA, um, we have a map, which is a searchable map, um, so folks can find Connecticut farm product. Um, we are working with NOFA to expand the search capabilities so that if folks wanted to go on and find bok choy, they could search specifically for a farmer who grows bok choy um, in their county or in the state in general. Um, also on that is going to be events listings. So farmers will be able to uh, provide and submit events. And that actually um, aligns nicely. We, for the first time ever, have a landing page on the CT Visit website. So one of the big goals of the campaign is really to grab traffic from all different avenues. Um, and so building out that relationship with CT Visit is really um, important and significant in an area that we haven't done before. Of course, there's social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube um, are all going to be taking place. Miranda Creative has a goal of 100 million impressions between now and the end of December. And what I really want folks to know is this is not a one and done effort. Um, this is being funded through an ever accruing a budget as a result of the Community Investment Act. So we have $100,000 annually to do Connecticut grown marketing work, generally speaking. It helps run some of our programs like the Farm to Chef program, but it is really intended to help maintain and uh, provide a consumer facing marketing campaign. And so in December, we'll be sitting down with the Miranda team and evaluating what was the most effective marketing strategies, where we should continue to have a presence, and we will be putting funds to this effort on an annual basis going forward. Um, if folks are interested in using the logo, we absolutely would love to have you do that. Um, we will be having a very comprehensive brand guidance document um, so folks will know how to use it. But in the meantime, we do have a one-pager 
um, and I can drop in um, the chat um, a link to where folks could download the logos. So um, we would love to see the logos being used on packaging. We've heard from a distillery, a maple sugar house, a brewery, a winery. Um, so please don't hesitate um, to share it if you're using it. We are going to be um, offering new Connecticut grown tents for farmers markets this year. That will be on the ConnecticutGrownStore.com website. We also um, have the new point of purchase cards for farmers markets for folks that use them. We don't have them in stock as of yet, but feel free to go on the website and order them. And once they come in, Haley Roland, who's also new to the Bureau, will be sending them out. So the tents aren't in yet either. I don't, I don't want folks to think that those are just ready to be picked up, but they will be coming in the next couple of months. So I really encourage folks to reach out to us and provide feedback to us. Um, if there's an area where, you know, you just feel there should be a presence and you're not seeing a presence, please let us know. Um, Commissioner said early on that he really wants everyone to feel comfortable communicating with us. I really, really echo that sentiment. We are the Ag Development Unit. We want to be supportive and help you develop your businesses. And if you feel that that's not the case, I encourage you to reach out to us in that fashion as well. One of the things that I really wanted to share, but we did a test run and it was a little clunky due to broadband and whatnot. Um, we have a really beautiful video um, which showcases the logo. Again, it was created through photography and video that was taken in September. So it's uh, relatively narrow in scope, but we do have intention of featuring and highlighting all farm products whether it be fiber, eggs, or produce. Um, there's even timber in um, the video. So, you know, this is really, um, our intention is to make sure that it benefits farm products as a whole um, and that everyone can utilize the brand and to participate in the campaign. Miranda Creative has also committed to doing um, one or two training workshops with producers. So if they are interested in learning how they can use the logo or leverage the logo, um, or even some general marketing um, tips and tricks as we head into the growing season, anticipate seeing something along those lines too. I would say that's about it. I'm gonna stop sharing and we can go, and I know we, we went over our allotted time, so I apologize for that, but um, I'm willing to stick around um, and answer questions and, and be available because I know we, we don't have a, a ton of opportunities um, for everybody to engage. Um, and Serena has been responding in the chat. I actually couldn't see the chat while I was sharing my screen, so I'm not sure what's out there or what's not uh, been addressed, but happy to do our best to answer and respond to questions from the group. Um, so I think the, the method we're going to go with, uh, we'd love to hear the voices of the people who asked some of the questions in the chat. So um, MC and I are going to go ahead and just call on a few people who uh, asked questions to read them aloud. Um, so the first that I'm seeing uh, is from Shannon. Shannon, are you there? I, I am. Hello, everybody. I wish I was in a big room with so many of you so we could say hello in person. <laughs> um, so what was my question? I can look back in the chat. Um, yeah, so the department has a lot of resources, as we know, with, with dairy and uh, bedding plants and a lot of resources for very large scale growers. And um, Farmland affordability is just is a very big obstacle for new beginning next generation farmers who tend to be more uh, diversified farms that we need to grow. And so I was wondering what the department in, um, is doing to work towards addressing this issue. And again, particularly for um, BIPOC farmers um, to have access to land in Connecticut. 
Yeah, happy to. And that's uh, um, one of the things that we've been working on my entire tenure in the agency. So thank you for the, for the question, Shannon. Um, the first thing we did was we created the, the Farmland Access Working Group um, that we did on our own. We didn't, uh, we didn't need to be compelled to do it. I volunteered to do it. Um, we commissioned um, AFT and the Working Lands Alliance and Yukon Extension to identify challenges um, to accessing land. And a number of folks on this call participated in that. Jamie has the final draft of the report in my inbox um, that I'm hoping to review tomorrow that we can finally release. Um, uh, part of that was the, the conversation uh, on OPAV that we agreed we would have the Farmland Preservation Advisory Board take a review at. Um, the other thing that was discussed that I actually submitted as proposed legislation was the ability to divvy up our PDR farms into smaller parcels so that we weren't protecting a 400 acre block that we were able to protect, um, you know, uh, 200 acres as a block and then say, you know, four or eight smaller parcels. Uh, this was something that actually a project that Will worked on my first year at the agency to identify how was our PDR farms being used. Um, how, did they actually create access? Were, were, were there opportunities for different folks? Um, the legislature, unfortunately, didn't take that up. Um, so I'm gonna ask all of you to write to your legislators um, and get them educated on this. Um, the feeling was that this was too big of a lift for this year. Well, that's one of the easiest things that we could do in the agency to make sure that we are protecting land at a more affordable rate and size um, for new and beginning farmers to get onto. Great, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the next question is from Susan Mitchell about the um, DEI working group. Susan. Sure, I put this in the chat that, you know, I recognize and I'm sure you all do too that we have a lot of people of color that work in farms in Connecticut who probably have been working for dozens of years. Um, who work on some of the larger dairy farms, who work in all the greenhouse operations, um, who are the actual farm workers who probably have some really interesting viewpoints for that DEI group that I wonder if they are being targeted um, and sort of recruited specifically for that group because I know Farm workers in general are very much overlooked um, nationwide in this country. And, um, you know, I just went into one of our large dairy farms and all the um, signs in the break room were all in Spanish. And, you know, unless we're specifically reaching them because they may not have legal status in this country, they may not have papers, they may not be able to take time off from work, they may not be given the opportunity. You know, and I just think of those people and I wonder if the department is reaching out to them. We, we haven't got anything specific, um, but we should probably and, and we should um, have a translation go out and, and release a, the a press release um, in Spanish, if nothing else. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure um, that we didn't just do a press release from me or through our ag report, um, that we, we made sure to get the governor, the lieutenant governor and Congresswoman Hayes on this was to get media coverage, to make sure that we were getting um, good media penetration so that folks were aware of it. We did push it out through our normal channels, um, including our social media pages, um, but we did get a lot of traction um, through that press release because we had um, the governor as the lead on it and it went out from his office as opposed to from our office. Um, so we haven't been able to, to target specifically farm labor, um, but we have been trying to make sure that we are getting this message out as loud and as far as we can, and also asking that our partner organizations um, share it out and disseminate it as well, that it can't just come from us um, in order to make sure that anybody who could be interested has an opportunity to apply. I'm seeing in the chat an offer from MC to amplify once that information is available in Spanish. And um, yeah, it would be, I think, great to see, you know, um, New Connecticut Farmer Alliance, Farm Bureau, the organizations that the department collaborates with uh, to help amplify that uh, as well, because that is a really 
crucial audience. Um, thank you, Susan, for, for bringing that up. And next I've got Gavin kind of on a similar um, tack, I suspect. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, bring up that New York State uh, recently, I believe it was 2019, um, removed the barrier for the NL NLRB to basically allow farm workers to organize. And I want to just bring attention that Connecticut should follow suit. And uh, it's not that it's illegal, it just um, farm workers can be fired for organizing. And I want to bring attention that we should actually be changing that in Connecticut also. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for raising that, Gavin. Uh, I would love to talk more on that um, from New Connecticut Farmer Alliance's perspective. Robert, are you on still? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, first, congratulations to the commissioner and the Department of Ag for uh, finding money in a budget constrained environment in the state to hire all these new people for the department, that's fantastic. Um, I was wondering if the department also uh, was able to um, increase its funding for any of its other programs um, in addition to hiring people. Um, and as an example, um, the grant programs that, um, that uh, Jamie spoke about earlier um, that have been restructured, um, is the department hoping that it will be able to make more awards to more farms um, because hopefully it has more money to do so. Great question, Robert, uh, and thank you for it. So our personnel comes from our PS line item. So there's not a blend between grants and, and PS and OE. So, that, so what we did was actually fill positions that were vacant um, that were otherwise, you know, with dollars that would have been swept back into a budget mitigation um, program. So um, there's not crossover from those dollars into grant dollars. Um, we have shifted some of the, um, the PS dollars to our administrative costs so that we have um, people spread out uh, on, on, their, on their budgets on different line items to make sure that we had the opportunity to hire them. None of those hires came at the expense of any grants or, or a pot of money that could have been used to, for grants. So I wanna make that very clear. Mm -hmm. um, we are hopeful that it, with the new transition grant program um, with the different levels that we will be able to hit more people as opposed to only doing essentially $50,000 blocks, um, you know, eight, eight or 10, $50,000 uh, projects that we'll be able to get a lot more um, reach with, with that revised program. And Jamie, I don't know if you have any other thoughts to add to that. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to point out that funding for transition specifically comes through the Community Investment Act. And I had mentioned that earlier when talking about the Connecticut Grown Program. The Community Investment Act uh, went into effect in 2006, and it funds the Department of Ag, um, Housing, tourism and historic preservation. Funds come through um, municipalities when folks make real estate transactions. Um, the municipality gets their small allocation and then um, the difference, you know, maybe $35, $40 ish goes to the Community Investment Act. And per statute, annually, excuse me, 500,000 goes to the transition grant, 500,000 goes to the viability grant, and then 100,000 goes to Connecticut Grown. Um, it also funds um, things like the Farm Wine Development Council, the Food Policy Council. Um, what is really special about Community Investment Act uh, funds for transition and viability grants specifically is that when a producer receives an award, say they budget that it's gonna be a $50,000 project, so their award is $25,000, and they spend, you know, 20,000 of that. The remaining $5,000 that was allocated to them doesn't disappear at the end of the fiscal year like typical general fund dollars would for a state agency. It stays there. And we have access to those funds year after year. So if a producer is awarded, you know, they receive a $32,000 award, something happens, they don't enter into the contract those funds don't disappear, it stays in the kitty. And so in theory, as projects come and go, um, 
the funds could be drawn down in its entirety on an annual basis, or we could have additional funds um, in you know, the following year. So some years you'll see we'll have about 450,000, other years we have 550,000. It really um, tends to sway, um, but that's typically how those funds run. And as commissioner said, you know, they're completely separate from uh, what funds uh, staff at the agency. Well, and I, and I want to highlight that the, the reason um, that we were able to do such a robust um, Connecticut grown marketing and media campaign mm -hmm. is because those dollars were not spent over the yeah. previous years. And so that line, um, line item had accrued to the point where we could do a large, um, a large project with it. Um, I would have, you know, preferred that they had been spent down every year, um, but because they weren't, we actually have the ability to make a, a bigger splash um, with the dollars and in, in the initial investment, and then use the hundred thousand dollar annualized funding that uh, CIA provides for for maintenance um, on the on the campaign. Great. So, um, let's see, a couple more. Well, one really quick thing, um, there was a question, is there a specific bill to reference in regards to the PDR reform? I think this was in response to the uh, subdividing of existing easements. Is that language available anywhere, Brian? The, 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 um, the committee didn't uh, include it in their original proposal. We actually, um, in our testimony, um, requested that it be put back in. Um, but we can get you the, uh, the bill number that it would have been. And I, in fact, I see Chelsea's on here. She probably has it on the top of her head um, quicker than I do. Um, but, uh, but it was submitted, um, not acted, not, uh, not included in the final bill that was voted out of committee. Thank you for that. And then um, I just want to acknowledge the sort of, you know, rare, this is directed towards our, our members primarily, um, the rare opportunity is to kind of have this audience with um, two of the folks uh, leading agriculture in this state and just kind of opening up the floor to folks who, uh, we've heard a lot about the programs that exist and that are uh, being created, but just to you know invite people who uh, feel that there's still a gap that needs to be addressed or um, a program that they would like to see to you know take the floor now to, you know, talk about that a little bit. So if you wanna raise your hand or um, again, type in the chat, we would welcome that. Well, I just wanna say that I, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a rare occurrence. Um, you know, we're happy to engage. And, you know, one of the things that we haven't really talked about, we keep talking about what's happening in ag development and resource conservation, but on the regulatory side, there's programs like the Shell Egg, um, grading program. We have a hemp pilot program. So there's other things happening in the agency just above and beyond. And, um, you know, we're happy to connect folks, even if they don't necessarily take place in ag development too. Well, and, and to that point, we're actually working with um, a couple of individuals that are new and beginning farmers um, on aquaculture um, with an oyster program and using our incubator um, yeah. land uh, down seaweed. in Branford um, and seaweed, correct, actually a 2021 um, young farmer, outstanding young farmer is a seaweed farmer. Um, so, you know, we, we are working and trying to reach um, new and beginning farmers, whether they be on land or under the sea. Great. Um, Steve Mono of uh, Masaro Community Farm. Steve, do you want to chime in with your question? Sure, thanks. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm really appreciative of the department for making adjustments to the grants program and reviewing that and <clears throat> adding the micro grant opportunity and such. And I'm curious if um, you're exploring more ways to direct resources to small side farms and farmers throughout the state. Um, and also noting that the growth of organics in the state has been, you know, a, a big uh, growth area. I'm wondering if the department has looked at a plan to help amplify that growth uh, or hire a specialist who might be, you may, might be able to focus on that. Well, I'll, I'll say one of the ways we're making adjustments is, you know, like we just explained with a transition grant, um, trying to, to better reflect um, uh, the, the needs, um, including, you know, we're, we're also in our funding priorities for all of our grant programs, um, talking about um, food systems, um, resiliency, climate change, controlled environment, 
Um, you know, Jamie brought up the, the Bridgeport hydroponics example. Um, you know, so we're, we're doing those things internally. Now they're not huge leaps and bounds necessarily, but they are progress. Um, and uh, we're recognizing that we need to shift. Uh, another thing that we're doing is events like this. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're making ourselves available to talk directly to people um, uh, and make sure that we, can, we have the opportunity to get the message out. Um, I don't know that we have a plan to support organic versus conventional. Um, my goal and my, my personal opinion is that the agency is responsible um, to support all types of agriculture um, and to make sure that we have resources to do that. And so our programs are not limited to one or the other, um, but the specialty crop block uh, grant program, <laughs> if somebody wanted to apply um, for an organics um, type of, of program, that would be the perfect place to do it. Um, you know, but it's not a, a specific um, organic um, versus conventional approach that we take. Steve, I know um, the USDA for the Organic Cost Share Reimbursement Program reduced their reimbursement from $750 um, to $550, $500. Um, I don't know what their plan is for 2021. They haven't released an agreement or um, a notice as of yet, but we're hopeful that it will go back up to where it originally was. I know NOFA did a lot of work to kind of backfill the difference through fundraising and whatnot for their producers, which is wonderful. And hopefully that won't have to happen again. So. And I do want to say, Steve, that um, I know that Masaro um, is familiar with the viability grant program. The viability grant program for this year and going forward is going to be restructured in more of a I'll call it a Q&A approach. So we pose a question, couple questions to the industry around major topics. Um, and we're looking for folks to uh, develop programs and projects in response to that. So um, in an effort to kind of move funding and um, efforts into being responsive, um, that's what uh, viability is gonna look like for this year. And if it doesn't work, well, then I guess we'll reevaluate it again. Any other questions from folks before we wrap up? I see there's a question about the shell egg program oh. from Nicholas. Nicholas, I would just warn you, be careful of asking for more regulation. There are a few comments about the pace of growth for uh, organics as opposed to the um, overall health of uh, the farm sector in general uh, and the pace of, kind of direct market diversified growers. So those are you know um, places that are uh, you know focus areas I think for the members of New Connecticut Farmers Alliance for years to come. Um, Nicholas responded to that egg piece that he cannot legally sell uh, eggs wholesale right now. So I think the problem mm -hmm. is not, um, he's not necessarily asking for more regulation, but asking that the regulation fit uh, operations that may not, um, you know, meet the, the current definitions and, and scales of the, as, of the regulation as it exists. Uh, it was so, hard enough to get a, a requirement um, to have um, a, a cooler um, for, for the sale of eggs at the end of driveways or at, at farm stands. Um, the legislature just really doesn't want to do anything that would extend regulation. Now, what we could probably do, uh, Nicholas, if you want to reach out to us, is we may be able to work out an MOU or, or demonstrate that you meet the requirements of the Shell Egg program um, that you could use um, to share with uh, whoever um, you're looking to wholesale to. Um, but I don't, I don't know that we would um, be putting together a program for the smaller operations. And quite honestly, I don't know that the smaller operations would, would welcome that um, if, if it was extended. I was going to say, Nick, maybe we can have a brainstorm and I can learn a little bit more about your farm because um, and then we can figure out what other opportunities and markets are out there. So. We're gonna stay hopeful that eggs are gonna be an eligible farm product for the Farmers Market Nutrition Program. 
So maybe that's a viable um, outlet. I don't know if you frequent markets or not, but why don't we plan to chat sometime after? All right, and then I'm gonna suggest that maybe this is the last uh, question that we take, just trying to be respectful of um, you know, folks' time. Uh, this is from Elizabeth and, oh, looks like Elizabeth and Hector's question might have been answered in the chat by Serena. Thank you, Serena. Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that no decision has been made. Um, I, I do know that um, Secretary Vilsack in every interview that I've heard him give or read has talked about the allocation of those dollars. Um, I believe 1 billion is being designated to their diversity, equity, inclusion efforts um, and their work group that he's set up. And then 4 billion are being made for loan relief. Um, I believe that you have to have had a loan through uh, USDA, and I'm assuming it's through the Farm Service Agency in order to qualify for that 120% relief, 100% of your principal, 20% of, um, of any um, interest or, or other taxes or fees that were on the, on the, um, uh, on the loan. But um, they haven't rolled out a program. I would um, suggest the USDA Farm Service Agency does a newsletter. Um, I'm sure that when this announcement is made um, that, the, um, that the FSA will be sending out uh, more information about who's eligible and how to get to your local county office for an appointment um, to, uh, to consider it. Um, the, the USDA Farm Service Agency loan office is down in Norwich. Um, their phone number and email are on their, their website. Um, you could give them a call to and, and see if they have any information that they can share. But my understanding is that the, the actual, um, the program hasn't been set up with a, with a trigger for, for uh, disbursement. Thank you for that um, answer to that question. I know that's, um, I've heard that from a, a few people lately. And so, um, Perhaps when there is more clear guidance, that's something that I'm, I'm sure we'll see go out through the Ag report and, and things of Absolutely. that nature. Um, well, this has been, uh, you know, it, this could probably go for another hour or two. So, uh, Jamie, I think to your point, we will plan to do this again. And uh, I would welcome, you know, any new Connecticut Farmer Alliance members or just any uh, folks on this call to reach out directly to. Uh, us with your concerns, reach out to the, the department for, um, you know, to give your feedback and with questions um, and see if we can, you know, make this uh, a more frequent occurrence. I think it would, uh, you know, benefit both the farmers in this group and, and future farmers uh, in, in our state. So. Um, Will I make a motion that next time it's at a farm with lawn chairs, like in a big circle or something. I don't know. Did you say right. a farm brewery? <laughs> there you go. Cut out. That what work. happened there? Or, that or like a plan bring your be. own farm brewery with you or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I miss seeing farmers and, and being with all of you at grower and producer meetings. This is appreciated and I love it. It's just not quite the same, but hopefully soon. I think, uh, so. I think we all agree with that. We're looking forward to getting back out onto each other's farms, hopefully in the near future. Um, MC, is there anything that you'd like to say in closing? No, just thank you so much to the commissioner and Director Smith and for everyone for coming. Um, this has been great and I definitely look forward to it happening again. Uh, look out for an email from me with the PowerPoint and I'll try to get all the links that were sent to the chat. I know I was just sending like link after a link for a while there. So. Um, hopefully you'll have access to all of that information via email. Um, yeah, really wonderful to see you all. I will just play some uh, Stevie Wonder to, <laughs> to close the evening. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.